Happy holidays, everyone. I don't know about y'all, but I love the feeling around this time of year. The cold weather, the smell of cinnamon and gingerbread filling the air, the decorations, the music, the vibes, mm, makes me feel warm inside. And the funny thing is, I can't stand any of it. I hate hearing the same three Christmas songs covered by a bunch of different artists played over and over again. Gingerbread tastes like hot bricks and putting up a Christmas tree is like pulling teeth. But man, do I love the vibe. And to match the holiday vibe, I gotta pick a game that really captures the Christmas spirit. You know, a game about a parasitic entity that has lived in our bodies for thousands of years and has decided to rebel and subjugate the human species. You know, really getting to the heart of what the holiday is all about. Okay, all right, maybe it doesn't, but some of this game takes place on Christmas and that's enough for me, so let's get into it. Let's talk about Parasite Eve. The development for this game begins in 1996. It seems after the massive success of Resident Evil, Square wanted to do something to match that, go a little darker, a little more mature. A year prior, a Japanese science fiction horror novel titled Parasite Eve, written by Hideaki Seno, was released. Sometime after that, Square acquired the rights to the book and would use it as the foundation to build their first M-rated title. Which, you know, it's kind of it's cool. I know it's commonplace now, especially with the success of the Witcher series, but a video game sequel to a novel wasn't really a thing back then. Now, whether or not it's canonically accepted as a true sequel to the novel is up to Hideaki Senna, and he didn't even know the game was being made until it was about to release, so... Now, the team they assembled to make this game? Oh, man. All right. First, we've got Hironobu Sakaguchi as the game's producer. We're talking about the man who created the Final Fantasy series and whose influence and creative vision not just shaped Square's games, but the trajectory of the company itself. Next, we've got Takashi Tokita, the director and writer of Parasite Eve, who already had a history at Sakaguchi, having collaborated previously as a game designer and writer on Final Fantasy IV, as well as directing the beloved Chrono Trigger. The character designs were crafted by Tetsuya Nomura, the man behind most of the iconic designs at Square and who would go on to direct the Kingdom Hearts series. And then we've got Yoko Shimomura, the composer responsible for the game's soundtrack. Now her career is a little different. All the others I mentioned earlier started at Square, but Yoko actually started at Capcom, where she, you know, created the soundtrack for Street Fighter 2. <laughs> She joined Square because she wanted to make music for RPGs, which she did. Live Alive, Super Mario RPG, and of course Parasite Eve. Now that's not all, but she's going to come up again in later videos, so we'll save that praise for when the time comes. But man, oh man, that soundtrack. Ooh! And that's just the Japanese side. Another aspect that was unique to this game was the division of labor. While the Japanese team were focusing on elements like story and gameplay mechanics, Square's American studio in Hawaii worked on the visual aspects of the game, such as the intricate and atmospheric pre-rendered backgrounds, as well as the CG cinematic scenes. Parasite Eve was also one of the first titles published under the Square Electronic Arts brand. This was a joint venture with Square and EA, where EA would help publish Square's games in America and Square would publish EA's games in Japan. The game was released on March 29, 1998 in Japan and on September 10th in North America to solid reviews. Most complaints were aimed at its linearity and short runtime of 10-ish hours, which seems crazy nowadays with how unnecessarily big some games have gotten, but this was Square's first big RPG after Final Fantasy VII, so I think people were expecting something a little closer to that and not this short horror RPG that broke away from many conventions found in the genre. One thing you hear a lot of people say when describing this game is Final Fantasy meets Resident Evil, which might give you the wrong impression. When people say that, I hear RPG meets survival horror, and that's not what this game is. The core gameplay elements that make up survival horror games like limited resources, puzzle solving, and the emphasis on combat are not here. It's just a scary RPG. I'm sure most people mean that when they compare the two, but I don't know, just so you don't get the wrong idea if you decide to jump into this game. Parasite Eve's battle system has a lot of things that RPG players will recognize while offering enough unique features to distinguish itself. The game uses the active time battle system that was introduced in Final Fantasy IV. Actions are regulated through Aya's AT bar. As the meter fills, you'll be able to choose an action, such as using items and attacking. When attacking, a dome will appear indicating the range of your weapon. 
If the target is inside the dome, the attack will hit. Outside the dome, it'll either do reduced damage or completely miss. Aya can also move freely around the battlefield, which you'll need to do in order to avoid enemy attacks. That's not to say you still won't be in menus picking and choosing what to do like any other RPG. Like I said, we've got some old, we've got some new. The magic system in this game is referred to as Parasite Energy. It works the same way magic does in the Final Fantasy series, but has more of a biological grounding within the context of the story. As Aya levels, she'll unlock Parasite abilities that she can use in combat, such as healing, temporary stat boosters, and more offensive abilities. There are no items to restore Aya's PE. It will recover over time during battle, but each time it's used, it will recover slower and slower, which would add a nice layer of complexity to combat, but switching to another set of armor will reset the speed back to normal, so... Eh. As you defeat enemies and level up, not only will Aya receive a boost to her basic stats such as defense, HP, yada yada, you'll also receive bonus points that you can use to speed Aya's AT bar, increase item capacity, or use to further enhance your armor and weapons. Speaking of armor and weapons, Parasite Eve has a really in-depth customization mechanic. Along with its base stats, each weapon comes with a set of slots and bonus points that can be swapped around to other items. Some of these weapons and armor will also have certain abilities attached to them, such as acid rounds or status prevention, and with tools, you'll be able to move those abilities to other weapons and armor. Doing this, however, will destroy the weapon or armor you're taking the ability or points from, so be mindful of your choices. This mechanic's really cool because it only takes a few smart decisions to have an extremely powerful weapon and armor set that will carry you through the game. Which isn't really saying too much because this game is kinda easy. Story is the focal point of Parasite Eve, and the game's linearity and short length lend to that. Not to say that the gameplay suffers as a result. There's nothing wrong with a short, easy game. As long as it's fun, who cares? But all that changes after you beat the game and unlock the Chrysler Building. It's a 77-floor test of endurance. Each floor is randomly generated, and every 10th floor is a boss battle, culminating in an optional final boss that results in an alternate ending, which we'll get to later. Or right now, let's start the story. The game opens with these cold shots of New York. We see a lot of popular landmarks of New York City, such as the Statue of Liberty and the Brooklyn Bridge, the Rockefeller Center rink and tree, but they're all devoid of life, and it's just creepy. You know what I mean? We reach Carnegie Hall, where we're introduced to our main character, Aya Brea. She's a detective for NYPD's Precinct 17, but tonight? Tonight, she's just on a date, and they're running late, so they hurry into the theater and take their seats to watch the show. During the actress's solo, she locks eyes with Aya, and all hell breaks loose. As the chaos dies down, the only two left are Aya and the woman on stage. Well, and Aya's date. But don't worry about him, we never see this man again. <coughs> Aya rushes to the stage. The actress begins to tell Aya that her body is changing, but in true police fashion, Aya just starts unloading. Stop resisting! Stop resisting! During the fight, something happens to Aya. The temperature of her body rises. See, you should have listened to what she was saying instead of letting your cop instincts take over. This is where Aya unlocks her parasite abilities, the first one she gets being heal. As the fight dies down, Aya has some type of vision. She sees a young girl lying in a hospital bed. As she's brought back, the actress floats backstage where she's made this massive ass hole. Before she jumps into the hole, she hears her backup arrive outside. You can return to the entrance if you want to. There's an EMT out there that can heal you and one cop will give you some ammo, like a, lo like a lot of ammo. As Aya reaches the bottom of the hole, she's met by a little girl who looks very similar to the one in her vision. Aya tries to talk to her, but she turns and runs before fading away. We are now even further backstage, I guess. Back here, we get introduced to the 
absolutely horrifying body horror shit we're about to experience in this game. A little more exploring and after talking to a charred up body that somehow can still hold a conversation and finding a diary we find out that the woman we're chasing is named melissa pierce the diary is a slow descent into madness as she obsesses over getting the lead her jealousy of having being double cast with another actress and overuse of some medication to try to keep her health up at the end of the diary we find a rehearse key which allows us to unlock the door at the end of the hallway there's also a clown back here too there's that. I mean, he dies, but, you know, there's a clown back here. Entering the room, we see the actress sitting at a piano, playing a haunting melody. We get to watch as the last vestige of Melissa is destroyed, and Eve is born. <laughs> After a quick battle, Eve tells Aya she needs more time until her mitochondria will be completely freed. Aya has another vision. It's the little girl lying on the hospital bed again, but this time a doctor emerges. When Aya snaps back to reality, Eve is gone. She's made another hole in the ground. We drop into this one and end up in the sewers, of course. After wading through literal shit, Aya catches up to Eve. She reiterates giving Aya more time to let her mitochondria evolve. She then turns into some goop and bounces, but not before leaving Aya a present. It's an alligator, because of course it is. What the hell else are you gonna fight in the sewers in a 90s video game? After finishing off the alligator, Aya ponders on what Eve said to her before she returns to the surface. At the entrance of the theater, she's met by this literal clown ass looking reporter. As the reporter hounds Aya, a man walks up behind him and just knocks his shit in. <gasps> it's Aya's partner, Daniel Bo Dallas. I don't know why they felt the need to give him the nickname Bo because no one in this game calls him that. As Daniel takes Aya home, or maybe to the police station, I don't know, he talks about her wuss boyfriend, which is like, man, come on, leave him alone, bro. People literally burst into flames in front of him. What did you want him to do? and why Aya was even at the opera in the first place. She said she saw an ad that caught her eye, but maybe it was something more. Aya comments that Daniel should be with his son, Ben, it being Christmas Eve and all, but Daniel explains that Ben understands that the job is the job. Daniel tries asking Aya more questions, but she dozes off. Day two begins with Aya, now in more casual attire, discussing last night's events with her comrades at the precinct. Though no one can make heads or tails of what I has told them, they all seem to at least believe her, which is, you know, pretty cool. I really like the pacing so far of the game. Day one, we get this huge cutscene that sets the tone for the rest of the game. We get a lot of action and a lot of questions, but not really any answers. Whereas day two, at least for the first half, everything slows down a little bit and we start getting some answers. Now, buckle in for a minute, because there's going to be a lot of exposition coming up. The chief of the homicide department, Baker, tells Aya to go meet Torres and strap up, so we'll head to the weapons department where we meet Wayne and Torres. They got this whole opposites thing going on. Torres is older, is by the books, and hates guns because his daughter died from a weapon mishap. Whereas Wayne is younger, ain't got no problem ignoring regulation, and fucking loves guns. Wayne also acts as our storage, so be sure to drop off the things you don't need, like extra guns and armor, and all the key items you picked up from Carnegie Hall, because one thing that this game does not have in common with Resident Evil is getting rid of key items when they're no longer useful. Leaving the weapons department, Aya sees a little boy walking around on his own. It's Daniel's son, Ben. Ben has tickets to a concert that he wants his father to come to with him, but Daniel tells him he can't go. He's busy. Angry, Ben storms off. Daniel berates himself for being the only one Ben has, but Aya lets him know that she was only raised by her father after her mother passed away, and he did a damn good job. 
Later, Baker holds a press conference in which he wants Aya to be there considering she's the only survivor. He wants her to keep the exact details under wraps until they know more, which isn't the worst idea because how the hell do you describe exactly what went down when you don't even know what went down? Baker goes ahead with the cover-up story, something about a rare, highly flammable chemical used to start the fire. But Aya breaks kayfabe and talks about Eve, mitochondria, and all the other shit, getting everybody panicked. Baker is furious. Well, uh, kinda. I mean, he yells a little bit, but his would-be tirade is interrupted by a call from a Japanese scientist who might have some information. They kinda just blow him off and instead go with the scientist who just wrote a new theory about mitochondria that's working at the American Museum of Natural History named Dr. Hans Clamp. So I and Daniel head to the museum. Ooh, hey, hey, look, that's a chocobo. Oh, they got a dinosaur exhibit? Oh my god, I want to see some dinosaurs. I would later find out that I, in fact, did not want to see any dinosaurs. After signing in, I and Daniel meet Dr. Clamp. When she sees him, she gets a vision again. Is Dr. Clamp the same doctor from these visions? He's your typical asshole doctor. Cold, condescending, dismissive, just an all-around ass. But boy, oh boy, does he give us all the info. He explains that the mitochondria in our bodies possess their own genetic code. That it's a separate organism in our bodies, like a parasite, if you will. That if all the mitochondria in the body were to function at the exact same time, that it could easily generate enough energy to cause combustion. That mitochondria has control of the body's growth. That it mutates 10 times faster than regular cells. And that possibly through hundreds and thousands of years of this rapid mutation and evolution, that it has reached a level beyond our understanding. Did I mention that this day was full of exposition? Clamp answers a good chunk of the questions we have, but not all of them. When Aya brings up Eve, Clamp shuts down and dismisses the two. When they make it back to the police station, Baker has a potential lead on where Eve might be next. The Christmas concert Melissa spoke about in her diary is today. It was canceled, but of course people are still gathering at the amphitheater. Daniel realizes this is where Ben wanted him to go. He rushes off with Aya in tow and the two head to Central Park. Why are we doing so fucking fast? Yeah, yeah, Daniel rushes in head first but stops when his arm catches fire. Aya promises she'll save Ben and heads in. Okay, first off, when you make it into the park, head into this room here and when you get in here, make sure you grab the key right here. There's no indicator that it's here and not grabbing it will have you wandering all around Central Park not knowing what the hell to do. Pushing through the park and fighting birds, snakes, plants, boomerang monkeys, and bears, Aya makes it to the amphitheater where Eve is addressing her audience. And seriously, why are you people here? The concert was canceled. Did you not see the news? The last theater she was in, everybody spontaneously combusted. Is this what y'all want to happen to? This is, oh no, this is, oh, this is worse. Oh, this is way worse. After turning the audience into this orange biomass of slime, Aya rushes backstage to confront her. But of course she flees. As Aya chases after her, she's guided by the little girl she keeps seeing in her visions. She eventually finds Eve, but not before having to fight a bunch of worms. There are four of them, and each time you kill one worm, the others will grow bigger until there's one giant worm. After beating the giant worm, we finally confront Eve, who invites Aya on a carriage, and of course, Aya obliges, which culminates in a boss fight on said carriage being pulled by a horse that's on fire. Aya, why did you get on this carriage? I like this fight though. It's not tough, but I like the cramped area. It really adds like some tension to the fight. After the fight, Eve speaks in vague phrases, but not before implying that Aya might not have as much control as she thinks, that perhaps it was Eve that drew her to the opera. Eve reaches out to touch Aya to help her understand, but the horse finally goes down, and the carriage slams into a light post, knocking Aya unconscious. We cut back to Daniel, still waiting outside the park. As he screams out to Aya, he's met by his son Ben, who is safe. He explains that he came with his mom, but she started acting weird. In his words, Mom wasn't herself, Dad. She left, and everyone else went too. Because of the second attack, an evacuation order has been issued for Manhattan. With Aya still missing, Daniel leaves Ben in the safety of the precinct as he goes to find her. Elsewhere in Manhattan, a Japanese scientist named Kunihiko Maida is pleading with the NYPD to let him enter the city. This was the person who called earlier and spoke to Baker. 
The cops can't understand him because English isn't his first language. One of them begins to mock and make fun of him, even telling him to go back to his own country if he can't speak the language. <laughs> oh my god, it's so funny, it's so funny. See, that's what being a bigot a dick gets you. Maida uses this distraction to sneak into the city. In her restless dreams, Aya sees a hospital before finally waking up. She finds herself in a dirty ass room with a barrel fire? Bro, you can't have a fire burning in a room like this, bro. You need some ventilation. It seems that Maida was the one who found Aya and brought her here. The reason for his visit to America is because what's happening in New York is exactly what happened in Japan a few years back, but on a much smaller scale. He basically just explains the book to him. Aya begins to worry as Eve's words get to her. She believes she's becoming a monster and is afraid of hurting Daniel and others around her. Daniel exclaims that he isn't worried about her hurting him, but she shouts that she wants to be left alone. Before leaving, Daniel reassures her that she's no monster. Aya sits quietly in the room alone. As she steps outside to plan her next move, she's met by Maida, and not too long after, Daniel. They're not gonna abandon Aya. They're here to stay, man. Ride or die. Maida asks if there's a research facility nearby. So after raiding a weapons store and a pharmacy, the three head to the Natural Museum of History, specifically Clamp's facility. Maida managed to collect some gel-like substance from Aya's clothes, and after taking a sample from himself and looking at the two under a microscope, he's shocked. Shocked? Well, not that shocked. It seems the mitochondria has taken over the sample Maida placed with the goo. Aya asks him to test a sample from her against the mitochondria. It seems that Aya's mitochondria is supplying her nuclei with more energy to help combat Eve's mitochondria. Maida goes on and on, bringing up Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, like, oh my god, bro, relax, chill. Luckily, Clamp comes in and interrupts. He sees Aya's sample under the microscope and begins to bombard her with questions. But this is interrupted by Daniel, who sees a list on Clamp's computer that has Ben and Lorraine's name on it, Lorraine being Ben's mom and Daniel's ex-wife. Daniel hems Clamp up, but before he can do anything, Aya stops him. Clamp demands they leave, and they do so. On the way back to the police station, Maida informs everyone that the list was an HLA, or human leukocyte antigen type listing. Why Clamp had that list is anyone's guess at this point. They head to the police station to get a warrant, I guess? He doesn't really say, the dialogue just ends and fades to black. But when they get there, the precinct is in shambles. Daniel rushes off to find Ben. Aya goes to follow him, but is stopped by Maida, who gives her a charm that doesn't do anything. Like seriously, for years, since this game has come out, people have been trying to figure out what these charms do and nobody has an answer. The police station is littered with the dead bodies of Aya's comrades. Although most of the people who are dead are just like nameless cops, which kind of sucks the severity out of the situation. I mean, it's crazy that Eve brought the fight to them, but it kind of loses its weight when everyone who died is just a bunch of red shirts. Well, except for one person. If we head to the weapons department, we find Torres is in bad shape. Wayne angrily shouts at Torres for not fighting back, but Torres, even staring down death, couldn't bring himself to use his weapon after his daughter's death. He passes the torch to Wayne and succumbs to his injuries. Elsewhere, we see Ben on the upper level of the precinct, chasing after one of the canine dogs, Shiva, completely oblivious to the horrors around him. The dog is acting strange, and Ben just wants to help her, but when he catches up to her, Baker grabs him and tries to get Ben to safety, where we get a nasty cutscene. Aya battling through spiders and dogmen, which at first glance just seem like mutated police dogs, but if you look at the artwork form, there's actually an upside down human face on there too, implying that Eve melded a cop and a dog together, which is fucking freaky. Finally reaches Baker and Ben, where she has to fight Cerberus, as the dog is now known. After putting Shiva to rest, Aya and Daniel reunite with Ben and Baker. Baker seems injured, but he'll survive. Ben, lamenting over the death of Shiva, asks Aya to stop whoever did this to her. Which is like, cool, but like, shouldn't you have been saying that about your mom?
After taking back the precinct, Daniel is now in charge, filling in for Baker as he recovers. She meets up with Mite on the third floor where he infers that Eve attacking the police station may have been a diversion. If this Eve is anything like the one from Japan, then her body won't last too much longer. And before she dies, she'll need to give birth to the ultimate being so she can pass her freed mitochondria to her progeny. But before doing that, she'll need one more ingredient. So the two head to the hospital where they have to stop Eve from stealing sperm. Okay. Before entering the hospital, Maida gives Aya another charm. <laughs> you fucking up inventory space, dog. Please stop with these charms. As Aya moves through the hospital, she sees the little girl again this time referring to her as Maya, Aya's twin sister who died when she was younger. As Aya tries to ride the elevator, Eve cuts the cable, sending her to the basement. Not only that, she cuts the power to the hospital and destroys the stairs leading up, stranding Aya on the basement floor. So Aya must find three fuses she can use to restore the power, which are pretty easy to find because they actually twinkle like Resident Evil items now. She also starts discarding key items she doesn't need either. Where was this before? After finding all three fuses and restoring power, Aya uses a different elevator to return to the first floor. Now the door in the lobby is open, so we'll head that way, I guess? In this room, we run into two survivors. The doctor's patient runs off, but the doctor pleads with Aya to save a nurse trapped in the next room. After clearing this room of enemies, it's revealed that this is the same hospital room Aya keeps seeing in her visions. She knows that one of those little girls is her sister Maya, and the other one is her but she doesn't remember why she was ever here. After saving this goblin-faced nurse, what, what, why'd they do this to her? She gives Aya the green key card and leaves. The doctor explains to Aya that the liquid nitrogen is used to refrigerate the sperm and that the sperm is located on the 13th floor. Wasting no time, Aya hops onto the elevator and heads to the 13th floor. Well, after fighting this little mini boss and turning off the liquid nitrogen. Then she hastily heads to the 13th floor. There she finds the research room, but she's too late. It looks like this place has been ransacked and the sperm stolen. Also on the 13th floor, if you go all the way down here, you get a glimpse of some freaky shit going on across town. Now when I was younger, I always thought this was the museum because, spoiler alert, that's where we end up in the next day. But it's actually the Chrysler building. Uh, yeah, it's the Chrysler building, obviously. Yeah, I know that now. But when I was a baby and I first played this game, I didn't know. I didn't know New York buildings. That's some EX game stuff, so we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Anyway, she finds medical records of her mother, Mariko Brea, and Maya Brea, her sister, who were rushed to the hospital after a car accident. Another file talks about Melissa Pierce being rushed to the hospital that same day and having an operation. Aya heads to the elevator to ride it up, I guess. I mean, where are we going exactly? I guess Eve wrote it too, because if you look closely on the ground, you can see an empty vial, so it looks like she already got what she came here for. As we reach the roof, we have another boss battle. We've got to fight this spider woman amalgam thingy, freaky shit. After the fight, we see Eve. She talks about the errors her sister made in Japan and how she's higher on the evolutionary chain so she would never make such a dumbass mistake. As the fighter jets zip past, Eve works her magic, well, I mean, her science, and kills one of the pilots, causing the jets to crash into each other. Aya begs Eve to stop, but she don't give a fuck. As Eve flies away, she leaves Aya alone to contemplate everything that has transpired. The medical records, her sister and Melissa were at the same hospital on the same day. That's not a coincidence. There's something much larger going on here. The pieces are there, but Aya just can't seem to. What the fuck is that noise? Oh shit, it's the jack! Oh, come on, this better not be a game. Oh my God, it's a game over. The game kind of warns you that this is gonna happen, but like, not really. There's a few of these little weird insta-death moments that are in the game, and if you're not aware of them, they can really set you back. Like, don't nobody wanna do that damn boss fight again? Luckily, there's only a few, but they're still annoying. Now, what we need to do is head to the scaffold and we'll escape the crashing jet. But it turns out spider Woman's still alive. She throws a baby at us, releases the brake. The shit's going down, man. Melting down. After killing the bug and hitting the brake, Aya jumps off the scaffold and is met by Maida and Daniel. Yay. On the way back to the station, Daniel informs us he's got some more information on Clamp. It seems he was fired from the hospital for selling patients' medical records, and that Eve was seen sneaking into the museum at night. I mean, go figure, right? Clamp is working with Eve. Ooh, worst kept secret, but whatever.
At the start of day five, we've got a few new places on the world map. We've got Chinatown and we've got this warehouse. Now the warehouse is a completely optional area. Now there's some good items and weapons there, but it's a pretty tough area, so you should probably save it for a little bit later. Now it's a race to find Eve, so let's head to the museum. Wait, no, hold on. We, we gotta go to Chinatown first because that's where she was sighted, I guess. As we reach Chinatown, Maida tells us that he saw the Central Park slime enter the sewers. So we gotta go through the sewers. Again. This time it's a much bigger area, but the screens are smaller and you'll fight like three or four enemies in these cramped areas. Ugh. But before we go down, of course, Maida gives us another charm. At this point, I don't even give a fuck, dog. Just give me all your charms, man. Just fill up all my inventory space. Who gives a shit? Clearly, you don't. Eventually, you'll find the audience, which has mushed itself into the city's reservoir and threatens to infect everyone in the city if we don't do something about it. Which is easier than it sounds. A little ways away and we'll find a control panel that will allow us to get it out of the water, which makes it throw a little tantrum and destroy some of the area. Pushing along, we make it out of the sewers and into a subway system. Needing a key to get out, we march along, fighting a giant centipede that, after taking enough damage, segments itself into four smaller, annoying pieces. Ugh. A little further up, we end up on the Brooklyn Bridge. There's a dead cop here that has the gate key that'll allow us to get out of here. Off in the distance, Aya sees the slime heading to the museum. After leaving Chinatown, but before heading to the museum, now is a good time to head to the warehouse and clear it out. Probably gained a few levels and you're a little bit stronger, so it'll be a little bit easier. Either way, we're still heading to the museum. As Aya enters, she sees someone, who is like, obviously Clem. He triggered the silent alarm, which shut down all the elevators, so he got to chase after him. And after chasing him and fighting armadillos, scorpions, chameleons, trudons, we make it to a room that he locks us in. To get out, we've got to climb through a window and drop down to the second floor. Ooh, in the mouth of a T-Rex. That's pretty cool. Hope this isn't foreshadowing anything. We move further in and find the security room where we can deactivate the alarm. On the security camera, we see Eve and she's looking pretty gross. We also get a scene of the slime animating the bones of a T-Rex. Yeah, I think I'm good on those dinosaurs, man. I don't want to see anymore. Heading back, we see that Clamp's door to his office is open. Aya bursts into the room to find Maida. He's been snooping through Clamp's office and found samples of Maya's liver cells. He also found Clamp's research on creating artificial sperm. Clamp created a specific type of sperm, which is what Eve took from the hospital. Where do you think he got that sample from? Probably used his own. Ooh, he nasty. Mr. Nasty time. Before we can find out what that damn HLA listing was for, Clamp bursts in and does some, you know, villain ranting before Aya tries to place him under arrest. Clamp lunges at Aya with a scalpel, but is laid out by Daniel. Defeated and with nowhere to run, Clamp does what any good villain does and explains his master plan. He explains that he removed the male mitochondria DNA from the sperm he created. This is what went wrong with the Eve in Japan. The sperm she used had traces of the male mitochondria that, when facing its own extinction, rebelled against Eve's mitochondria, resulting in the death of the ultimate being. But where that Eve failed, this one has succeeded. With Clamp's special sperm, Eve is pregnant and will soon give birth to the ultimate being. What the fuck is this game, bro? With no more information to give, Clamp yells out to Eve that he is ready. His body bursts into flames. Daniel and Maida jump through the window to avoid the danger, and of course, Aya is unscathed. In his final moments, as Aya tries to help him, his contempt never wavers, as he uses his last breath to call humans pathetic. Well, fuck you too, shit. Taking Clamp's key from his body, we head to the third floor where we have to fight a Triceratops. Man, fuck these dinosaurs, man. This Triceratops was hard as hell to kill. This thing's tanky as shit. After defeating it, it tackles Aya through a window where we end up on the first floor where we have to fight that motherfucking T-Rex. Hopefully by this point, you've hit level 33 and unlocked Liberate, which is Aya's final parasite ability. She transforms into this blue-green kind of angelic looking creature and it hits the opponent multiple times and it sure does make the fight easier. After taking down the T-Rex, we head to the fourth floor to this room completely covered in some nasty shit. Here we finally confront Eve, who is pregnant as hell. Still looking gross, but I don't know, she kinda wears pregnancy well. She's got that glow, you know what I mean? Fuck no, baby. She's in a vulnerable state, so instead of fighting Aya, she calls the audience to save her. The slime combines to turn into this giant humanoid creature that takes Eve away from the museum. 
As Aya leaves the museum, she's met by Maida and Daniel, who have more information. When Melissa was younger, she received a kidney transplant, Maya's kidney, and one of the interns that was present during the operation was Clamp. The drugs that Melissa kept talking about in her diary were actually immunosuppressants that helped prevent the body from ejecting the transplant. But the overdose on these pills left Melissa's body in a weakened state, weak enough for mitochondrial Eve to take control. This news upsets Aya. This connection she felt with Eve. Was it really Maya she felt? Maida tries to reassure her that this isn't her sister, but I ain't trying to hear all that shit. While this is going on, the Navy has gotten the go-ahead to launch a full-on assault against Eve. The slime monster forms a protective barrier around Eve as the Navy attacks. And, you know, it goes about as well as you expect. The slime repels all the attacks and retaliates by, like, blowing them out of the sky, like, of course it did. Now, while all that's going on, a helicopter lands in the middle of the road and picks up Aya and the gang and takes them to Admiral Williams, who welcomes them aboard the USS Nimitz, which is a real aircraft carrier of the United States Navy, named after Chester William Nimitz, a fleet admiral in the Navy and played a major role in commanding the U.S. Pacific Fleet during World War II. They've devised a plan to nuke Eve, but no one can get close enough to launch because, you know, they, they die. So they want Aya to basically sit in a chopper running on autopilot and when it gets close enough, nuke the shit out of Eve. Aya agrees, but before she leaves, Maida tries to give her another item. But Daniel shuts that down. Good, I'll let useless shit take it up my space, bro. I ain't got time for all that. Aya hops on the helicopter and her and four other choppers head towards the creature on Liberty Island. As they close in, they change formation, forming a straight line to protect Aya from the slime monster's attacks, laying their lives down to make sure Aya succeeds. That's pretty badass, and it works. Aya gets the shot off and destroys the slime monster once and for all, taking it down and Eve along with it. Everyone begins to celebrate and tells Aya to return to base, but Aya can still feel Eve. Which, I don't know, I mean, I, I think we did it. We did a pretty good job. We nuked her. I don't think she's going to survive a nuke or anything like that. I mean, shit, it's, oh, okay, well, there she is. Aya straps up and jumps from the helicopter, parachuting down to Liberty Island where Eve awaits. Eve is angry at Aya for taking sides with the humans, that the only reason humans have achieved all they have is because their mitochondria has allowed them to, creating the perfect environment for the mitochondria to prosper, and now humans are no longer needed, so they got to go. Hopefully you've hit level 33 by this point and unlock Liberate because it sure does make the fight easier. After taking enough damage, Eve will evolve, taking on this space alien angel appearance. After defeating this form, Eve, now realizing Aya is her natural enemy, tries to escape. But her body, either due to the damage we caused or using up too much energy, or probably a combination of the two, begins to fall apart. She hits us with an ominous grin before finally melting into a pile of goo. Eve is no more. With Eve defeated, everyone can finally relax, right? I mean, she's gone, but the vibes are bittersweet. She still killed thousands. Torres, Ben's mom, Shiva. And what about Aya? Why did her mitochondria manifest and take a more passive role? We don't really have time to ponder these questions because some shit is brewing and all that goo in the ocean. Eve succeeded. The ultimate being is born. Oh, wh wow. Oh, okay. I didn't really expect it to be a baby. I mean, what else would it be, I guess? Emerging from the ooze, it lets out a scream that destroys the ships around it. It's time to get the hell out of here. But wanting this to end, Aya stays knowing she's the only one that can stop it. Maida, one last time, tries to give Aya something, but Daniel stops him again and the two leave on the chopper. With everyone out of harm's way, it's time to beat the shit out of this baby. As we fight the ultimate being, it will evolve quite a few times. We get the newborn form, child, and adolescent. Hopefully by this point you're level 33 and unlock Liberate because it sure does make the fight- Okay, you got it. You got the joke. You know what I'm about to say. When it evolves into its adult form, everything you do does no damage. Daniel and Maida watch from the chopper as all this goes down. We finally figure out what was so important that Maida tried to give us. It's special bullets with Aya's cells in them. Wasting no time, Daniel grabs the bullets and leaps from the chopper. 
As he gets closer to the ship, his body bursts into flames, but before hitting the water, he tosses eye of the bullets. Now we doing some damage. It won't take long before the ultimate being is down for the count. We finally did, no, wait, no, it's still alive. Out of bullets and with no other options, Aya rushes inside the ship. She sees the engine room on the map and decides that, fuck it, blowing this ship up is the best chance we got at killing this thing. Okay, I guess. I mean, I didn't know it was so easy to blow up ships, but yeah, you know, whatever. Do what you gotta do. Now all we gotta do is make our way through the ship we've never been through before to reach an engine room we've never seen to blow this place up, all the while being chased by the ultimate being. One wrong turn or one slight misstep and this thing touches you? Game over. Gotta do all that shit over again. If you can manage to reach the engine room and escape the ship, congratulations. The ultimate being is dead and the day is saved. Reunited, Aya, Daniel, and Maida look off into the distance. Aya contemplates again why she has the power she does. Maida explains that Maya's mitochondria is in Aya as well. Aya was born with a defect in her right eye and when she was seven, she received a cornea transplant from her sister. The visions that Aya kept having were actually flashbacks. The last images Maya saw before she passed away that had been burned into her cornea. Maya's mitochondria and Aya's body went down a different evolutionary change and formed a more mutualistic relationship with Aya's mitochondria instead of the more parasitic that happened in Melissa's case. Maida also hits us with this dour message that if the Earth was a body, we're kind of like a virus upsetting the natural balance that will lead to our demise, yada yada. You know what he's saying. Not saying that there isn't some truth in it because there is, but like we've heard this all before, you know, maybe we're the real bad guys type stuff. Sometime later, we pick up with Aya and the gang heading to the same theater this whole shit started in. And it's like, why the fuck would you do that? I understand that Eve is gone, but like, why in the hell would you come back to the same place where a bunch of people were burned to death by a parasitic entity that evolved from the same material that every single human on this planet has? I can't enjoy myself now. I'm looking over my shoulder for the rest of my fucking life thinking it can pop off at any time. Yeah, see, y'all clearly got some PTSD from that shit. Get the fuck out of here and go see a therapist, you weirdos. As the solo starts, something happens. See? See? Like, what is this? What the hell is going on? Is the Eve persona inside of Aya finally awakening and we're about to get a part two of what Eve started? Or maybe, maybe, Aya's mitochondria is communicating with everyone else's to make sure another rebellion won't happen. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. And that's it. Well, no, it's not. There's, there's another ending. After you beat the game and make your final save, you'll see a new label on it. EX game is damn near exactly the same as your original run. You'll start back at level 1, and all the bonus points you spend on AT speed and item capacity is gone. Enemies are a little tougher, but you won't notice because right before the final fight on day 6, Wayne lets you engrave one of your weapons and your armor set that will carry over to the EX game, as well as everything you left in storage with them. So even though you'll start over, you'll still be miles ahead and stomping the shit out of everything. Initially, the amount of bonus points you get is higher too, especially at the end of each day. Now after day one and you get access to the world map again, you'll be able to enter the Chrysler building. Now the Chrysler building, it'll test you. Oh, oh, it'll test you. Again, 77 floors, every floor is randomly generated except for every 10th floor, which is a boss fight. You know, we covered all that earlier. Now after reaching the final floor from this cocoon, a little girl emerges. Aya can't believe her eyes. It's Maya. 
but this little girl corrects her by calling herself the original Eve. Maya's liver cells that Clamp had? He continued to study them, and I guess at some point these cells created its own independent body? So while Melissa Eve was doing her thing, this Eve set up shop in the Chrysler building, so in case Melissa Eve failed, this purebred Eve would survive. This Eve cruelly allows Maya's consciousness to manifest. A lost and confused Maya recounts the moments before the car accident and wanting to get home to her sister. But before Aya can talk to her, Eve re-emerges. An angry Aya raises her gun at Eve and is ready to end all this shit. Hard fight. Hard fight. Hardest fight in the game. But after defeating purebred Eve, something begins to stir inside of Aya. A voice from inside her body speaks to her. It's Eve. The mitochondria in her body has fully awakened and is beginning to rebel against her. The Eve persona begins to take hold of Aya's body, but Maya's consciousness emerges and fights back. Maya manages to purge Eve from Aya's body, reverting her body back to what it was before that horrific night at Carnegie Hall. No more parasite abilities, and no more Eve. With the enemy completely gone, Aya leaves the Chrysler building with this newfound connection to her sister. Pretty cool ending. Too bad Parasite Eve contradicts all this, so consider this non-canon. I love Parasite Eve. I just, I love this game, man. One of my rituals every year is to play this game around Christmas time. The gameplay is aged pretty well, but the story, the music, and that atmosphere, mm, mwah. This game hit me in my formative years and messed me up in a good way. This, Silent Hill, Resident Evil all formed what kind of horror I was going to like growing up. And to be honest, Resident Evil 2, which had came out earlier the same year, and Silent Hill, which came out less than a year after the release of this game, did horror better. Better seems like such a slight towards the game because it scared the shit out of me when I was younger. And there's just something so unique about it that it's hard to even put into words. And I'm not even going to try. So go play the game if you haven't and have yourself a good ass time. Happy holidays, everyone. Go away.